because there's a path between f of a of f and b and u, so far in my development doesn't give me the ability to do anything. It's just a path. However, I will be able to turn these paths into equivalences. So there will in, back, in fact be a mapping that turns this into an equivalence between f of a and f of b. And that's called id to equiv. So it will be id to equiv of app fp is an equivalence. That's what we're, what we're going to get to. And that way you know if you have an element of this type, okay, if you know that this has a path between here and here, id to equiv will extract from you a transport function, okay, that goes back and forth. And now I want to talk about the transport. So what I want to do is I want to say is if we have p, I'm having to slightly Im improvise because I, my, I have more in my notes than I'm going to have time to cover. So if I have a path between here and we have such a function here, then what I want to say is there is something called transport. Uh, sometimes we write f up here, okay, uh, as a, like an index on it. Uh, oh, and we need an element of the first, well, you can write it a different way. So transport of p will be from f of a to f of b. That's the way to write it. And that thing is often notated p lower star. The, the notation is a little not the best because you really need to know what f is <laughs> in order to know what p lower star is. But in many situations, the f is, a, is clear. And then you're just saying, you just write p lower star. But actually, it should be transport, uh, uh, transport by f along the path p. But often we write p lower star. OK. So what I'm going to do is just define that thing by path induction. That's what we're going to get at. OK, so how do we do this? So I'm going to claim that we can define that. So here is the motive. So we're going to do this thing by path induction on p. OK, what is the motive? Can, so, tell, can someone tell me what the motive should be? I claim the motive should be given x and a and y and a. I want f of x arrow f of y. Yeah, somebody said that, I, I heard. But anyway, yes, that's right. So the motive is going to be that this is, this is in u, right? The type or the proposition in question says, for any x and y, I can transport from f of x into f of y. Later, what I'm going to show is that p lower star is, in fact, an equivalence. OK, but first I want to define this mapping, and then I will show that it's an equivalence. I don't think I'll have time, but I will state that it's an equivalence. And then I will finish with univalence. So let's get here. So here's my motive. So that's a good motive because it will let me conclude, if I can fill in part two, OK, it will let me conclude that for the particular path I plug in a and b, that I have a map from f of a to f of b. And what is that? Let's write my colons backward. This will be some instance of j by that motive of some argument yet to be filled in applied to p. So in fact, I will not only know that you have this transport, but I will know that transport on f of reflexivity is reflexivity at the appropriate type. And knowing, or definitionally, this should be definitional, is definitionally equal to that. Knowing that will allow me to show that transport is functorial, is functorial in P, that it is respects the path structure, composition and inverse. I, who's, who's what, sorry? That should be oh, what, sorry? The identity function, it doesn't matter. The identity function, uh, is the identity function, yeah. <clears throat> Transport of REPL is the identity function, yes. So this is a case where I did it backward. <laughs> Often I'm tempted to write identity when I mean REPL. In this case, I wrote REPL when I meant identity. Okay, so. What's that again? The therefore dots. The therefore, yeah, that's the therefore, yeah. 
I mean, I'm just like, I, I've, I'm trying to be rigorous in helping you understand how to use path induction. And the steps are write down the motive. There's something sufficiency you have to establish. Therefore, something, and then the something is always a J. And be, because that's path induction. And that J, e the equivalence, the, this definitional equality for J will give us that definitional equality. And that definitional equality will be enough for us to prove other interesting properties of transport. Like, what if you do a multi-hop transport? Well, that's the same thing as a one-hop transport along the composition. You can prove all of that, okay, by path induction. So I'm not going to do that right now. So the only thing is I need to do is what is the sufficiency? Well, it's very easy. I need to show that for x and a, there is something whose type is f of x arrow f of x, right? Because it's, it suffices to consider reflexivity as my path. There's no path involved. So that the endpoints are identical. So in this case, it suffices to consider it when the endpoints are identical. And the answer to that is lambda, let's call it lambda u, lambda u, u. So the thing I fill in here is x dot lambda u, u. If you were to write the types, that's where the x would be, lambda u colon f of x dot u. OK, so that's why it's x dot. OK, and we're done. We have the notion of transport. And then as an exercise, you can show that, I'll just write it briefly, REFL lower star is REFL. You have to make it all precise. But uh, if I take P inverse lower star, that's P lower star inverse. And if I take P concatenated with Q lower star, that's P lower star composed with Q lower star, function composition. Okay, you can write, you can do all that. It's in the hot book, but you can do those as exercises. Those are all proved by path induction using the properties of transport. Now, as the identity, yeah. Ay ay ay. Yes, I'm. I'm unfortunately in the position of rushing, and it's never a good idea to rush. So. But on the other hand, what I'm doing is I'm speaking to you in the back of my mind. I'm backtracking on what I was going to cover and trying to figure out how to get to the endpoint I want. Okay, so now the endpoint I want. So the endpoint I want is this, because we'll run. We're we're out of time now, uh, and, uh, so I'll let me just finish it up. You can also show that, in general, you can show that the transport is an equivalence of types. Okay. So another thing that can be done is, so moreover, transport is an, e is an equivalence. Transport of P is an equivalence. It really follows from what I'm doing over here. It's an equivalence. I didn't really, where I glossed over, where I'm cheating you in this lecture is I haven't really developed the exact definition of equivalence in order to really prove this to you, so that's the part that I'm glossing over, okay? But the heart of it is you have transport, and transport has enough structure so that not only do you know that f of a maps to f of b, but in fact it's an equivalence. And being an equivalence means it has a pre and a post inverse up to higher homotopy. That's the part I'm waving my hands about I ran out of time, okay? So that's important. And now we come to the following thing, okay? Which is where I will end, which is the principle of what is called univalence. So, so this is the univalence axiom. So what we know is, we know that if A is equal in U to B, then A is equivalent to B. Okay? So this we know, the axiom is next, okay? So we know this. That is, if I have a path in the space U, then that induces an equivalence. Remember, I told you this picture. We can think of U as being inhabited by these points, which are like A and B, okay? And so there's a path between them. They're just points in a space. But the space has structure. Meaning that these points aren't just points, they are themselves types. So if I zoom in and I look and I turn up the magnification, 
I will discover that A is actually an island filled with people, <laughs> and B is actually an island filled with people, and they're all waving at us, and there's a path between them. But a path is just, it's an axiomatic thing. The idea of the identity type is an abstract type, so it's an abstract type. I just have a path between, okay, these two things. But I can, via transport, induce an equivalence between these two types. And what is an equivalence? I can turn that path into a mapping this way and a mapping this way, such that if I go round trip, I will get things that are homotopic. There's, a, there's some equivalence between them, okay? So in other words, if I take x and I send it over here to x prime and I send it back, I will get something which is homotopic to it and the other way around. But if I take x prime and send it over to x and then send it back and I get, you know, x triple prime, it'll be homotopic, okay? That is, there will be a path between them. So it's a weak idea of inverse. It's the right one because if these were just points, if, in other words, if this was a set, that's the idea. If this were a set, like the set of natural numbers, it's not, it's a universe, but if this were the set of natural numbers, you, you, there's no zooming in, it's just a point. And so being homotopic is to be identical because it's a set. But it, the universe is not a set. The universe is a homotopy one type. Okay, that's what it's called. Which means that I can zoom in and the individual points themselves have structure. And so the existence of a path is quite non-trivial. It corresponds to, it induces at the very least, an equivalence between those types. So what does the univalence axiom say? It says that there's an equivalence between equivalences and paths in the universe. That's the univalence axiom. The univalence axiom says not only does every path induce an equivalence, but every equivalence induces a path. Because you see, until I impose the univalence axiom, there might be a paucity of paths in you. Maybe there are none. Because you see, if you write down the type theory, think of what I told you. The only intro form for the identity type I've given you so far is reflexivity. So the only path would be between A and A in the universe U, until you have univalence. Then univalence says, oh no, there is a boatload of paths, okay, in the universe U. There's one for every equivalence, okay? And in fact, every equivalence can be turned into a path, and if you turn that back into an equivalence, you get an equivalent equivalence. I know, it's like, it's, it's, it's gorgeous. It gets a little complicated, but it's gorgeous. And the other way around, if I take a path and induce an equivalence and bring it back to a path, I'll get an equivalent path. It'll be equal up to higher homotopy, okay? So the univalence axiom says equality in the universe is equivalence of the types that they represent or that they contain. That's the principle of univalence. For example, if I had a, if I had a universe whose elements were, and this I'm not able to explain here, what are called homotopy minus one types or homotopy propositions, Homotopy propositions, h-props, are things that are either, you could say from a classical point of view, are either empty or have one in element. Either they're true or they're, or they're not, okay? All the, all the, in other words, all of the, uh, the space of equality, uh, anyway, uh, th th that's the way of saying it. Um, then what this would mean is that interprovable propositions are equal. For h-props, okay, for h-props, and you'll see which are known as minus one types, then what we will have is that interprovable h-props are equal. So if I can show A if and only if B for types that are so degenerate that they have at most one element, they're sub-singletons, that's the way of saying it, they have at most one element, if I have degenerate types, the types that are sub-singletons, proving A if and only if B means I have a map. If it goes from A to B, there's only one place it can go. And if it goes from B to A, there's only one place it can go. Okay, so that's an equivalence because there's no room to not be an equivalence. There's nowhere to go. Okay, so if I have interprovable h-props, 
they're equal. One is replaceable by the other in all contexts. Oh, that's, that begins to become extremely useful. In fact, here's another idea about it. If they are sets, then for what are called homotopy sets, H sets, or zero types, then what we say is that bijective sets are equal. That is, if you have a bijection between two sets. So what do I mean by a homotopy set? A homotopy set is a space whose path structure is degenerate. The only paths are self-loops. It might have a lot of points, but the only paths are self-loops. So NAT is a set. It's a theorem. This is a, this is a zero type. NAT is a set. It's a zero type. It has no non-trivial equations. You have seven, you have eight. There's no path between seven and eight. There's only a path from seven to seven. That's it. Why? Because intuitively, there's no fine structure to the elements. Okay? The elements are little atoms, and either they're equal to it's the same atom you're talking about or not. That's it. Okay? There's nothing to say. That's what sets are. So sets are a very degenerate uh, form of type. They are what are called zero types. Types for which all of this infinite higher dimensional structure is completely degenerate. There are no higher, higher paths. Because there is only, because we cut off here, there's only reflexivities, then the only paths between paths are further reflexivities, and it's reflexivities all the way up. So that's a, a degenerate thing, and it's called a zero type. Okay? So what the univalence axiom tells us is that if you have a bijection between two sets, you can treat them as equal sets. That has application to what is called generic programming. Because you see, suppose I have two sets that are in bijection with one another. Let's say, uh, you know, uh, what's a good off the top of my head example? Uh, a good off the top of my head example involves uh, uh, two to the two and two cross two. Okay? That is a function space or the product. I hope I, I, hope I have that right. And those should be bijective, I hope. OK, there should be a bijection between those two. So if I have like a list of two to the twos, that's equal to a list of, or can be transported, equal in the sense of higher homotopy and supports a transport, to a list of uh, two cross twos. That's generic programming. That's what generic programming is all about. It's the functorial action of type constructors, like list. That's it. That's the entire subject of generic programming, is the functorial action of a type constructor. End of discussion. Okay, so if you're in a type theory that has a grand theory of, yeah, functoriality on steroids, okay, then I can exploit that to do like generic programming, and then this is the key to making that work. Okay, there are other things. Dan is going to cover a whole bunch of examples of this flavor. He's going to show you. I know, I know a few things he's going to do, so I won't say any more. But the univalence axiom has lots of implications. Okay, and uh, he will spell spell those out for you. So. The interesting thing is that we treat the proposition as a type, and we say the space of proofs that A and B are equal, that is, the path between A and B in the universe, is equivalent to the space of equivalences between A and B. It's quite beautiful, because it, 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 it generalizes the conventional mathematics things where you might say, A is equal to B and U if and only if A is equivalent to B. That's true. But we're saying more. There's an equivalence between the proofs of such a thing. So it's a much uh, richer field, okay? And from a C CS point of view, that's where all the action is because we're talking about the structure of the programs of certain types, okay? So that's what we're doing. Okay, so there's page upon page of things that I prepared yesterday afternoon that I'm uh, not gonna discuss. Uh, so what's going to happen is, oh, oh yeah, so a little finishing uh, exercise which, uh, well, now let me stop there. I, I'll stop there. We're, we're running out of time. Okay, I, uh, Dan, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to then turn this over to Dan. He's arriving tonight. We're going to have dinner. I'm going to have a handoff to him uh, to tell him, and then he will, uh, he will pick up from here and talk about primarily various applications of homotopy type theory and working within homotopy type theory, and then he'll do a bunch of hacking with Agda. I think Ian, where are you? There you are. I think Ian is going to be TAing, right, so effectively? So Ian will be your, uh, your tour guide for uh, programming. You're going to use Agda, right? Yeah, so programming these things in Agda. Agda is m vastly better for doing homotopy type theory. It's not the right thing yet, but 
it's vastly better than caulk is, I think, for doing homotopy type theory. So uh, that's where a lot of the advances came, is working that way. So you will you will get a you'll get a uh, you'll get a, a a a chance to do that. Okay, so um, that's those are my five lectures. So I'm finished. Thank you very much for your attention. I I think this is my uh, tenth or eleventh summer school, and uh, every summer it's like the highlight of my year. So uh, I appreciate very much having the chance.